One of the first features of SAS that you'll likely use is nesting. It's a natural first step into what SAS can do, and while it may look a little odd at first, it won't take long to get used to. We're gonna go ahead and we're gonna format this page with some CSS. I'm gonna go into my SAS file, I'll get rid of this body background red, and we'll start off by making a rule on our container. So I'm going to write hash container, and then I'll hit return. Because I've already saved the file as SAS, Brackets is already recognizing the indentation that is necessary to create a SAS file. If you're not using brackets and you're using some other editor, you're going to need to be mindful as to your indentation because SAS does require the appropriate indentation. The first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to add a font family and I'll be using Barlow and then defaulting to sans serif. This is a Google font and if you recall in my HTML file I already added a link so that I had access to this particular font. I'm going to hit return and add a couple of other rules. We're going to specify that this page has a max width of 800 pixels. Another thing that we need to be careful of when we're writing with SAS is we need to make sure that we have this extra space right here. And I added a semicolon here. SAS doesn't need the semicolon, so we just put new declarations on their own lines. I'm gonna also add a margin of zero and auto here. And again, be mindful of these spaces. If I didn't have a space there, I would go ahead and get an error. Let's actually leave that there and let's save. And right away, I'm gonna get an error message. So the error message is from Koala and it's letting me know, hey, this property is not going to render. So what I'm going to have to do is go back into my file and if I add in the appropriate spacing and now save, that error goes away. If we look at our page in the browser, you'll find that now the page is rendering with the appropriate font family that I've specified. Let's add some additional styles. The next thing that I'm going to do is I'm going to begin by styling out the form element. I have this search box here and I want the search box to look different. I'm going to create a bunch of styles so that I can modify this and customize it. I'm just going to review the HTML so you're familiar with what I've done. I have a form tag that's wrapping around two input tags. The first one is an input tag that simply is going to be a text box that is going to display the area where the user would type in whatever it is that they're searching for. Then I have another input field, which is the button. This is the go button that the user will click once they've typed in their search. This second input element is wrapped inside of a span tag with a class of wrap. And in addition to the input tag, I have an additional span tag that is creating this font awesome caret left. So that's the little arrow that I'm using right here. I needed to have this span tag called wrap wrap around both the input and the span tag with the font awesome so that I could style these and have them be positioned in relation to each other. Let's go back into the CSS. I'm going to create my new rule so I simply hit return and make sure that I outdent. So the first thing that we're going to do here is we're going to make a rule on the form tag. I'm going to tell my form tag to float on the right so I'll add float right. This is going to allow the form tag to position on the right hand side. Now I want to add some additional rules to my page so that I can format some of these other elements. So I want to start by formatting my text input field and my go button. It is common that when you're building a form element, especially something like a search box, you would want a particular style or group of styles that would format the search box without impacting other form elements that are might appear elsewhere on your page. So normally you would use specificity to be able to specify those items. Now currently our form tag is just a form tag. Let's add a class attribute and I'm going to add a class of search field. This is so that I can uniquely target this form field. I'll go back into my SAS file and instead of using form right here I'm going to change my selector to just be form.searchField. This isn't going to change anything on my page, I'm just being more specific. Now that I've done that, I'm ready to start formatting or styling some of the other elements. The next element that I want to style is this input field. This input field has a class of search. So normally, if you are writing CSS, you would write form.searchField space dot search. And you would want to be more specific so that you could specify 
With sass, you can use indentation to your advantage. And indentation is great because it helps your CSS to be much more readable and much more clean. I'll hit return, and instead of writing another property, I'm going to write my selector, which is dot .search. Now when I hit return again, you can see that my blinking insertion point has already been indented. And if I go ahead and write the new rules that I want, we're gonna be changing the padding, the background color, and the border. Those will all be indented like so. If we save our file, and we go look in the browser, you can now see that my search box has been formatted with this background color and there's some padding that's been added on and I've removed the border. Now, let's take a quick look at the CSS. I'm going to open up my CSS file and you can see the selectors that I have. I have form.search field, open curly brace, float right, and then close the curly brace. And then, it's already indented this, but this is actually a new selector, form.searchField.search. I didn't write that selector name. It was generated via the SAS and the indentation. So when you indent, it's going to use whatever the parent item is as part of the selector. So that will be added first, and then the second item is going to go ahead and be added. And when it's compiled, it's going to write something that looks like this. So now I want to add another selector. I'm going to outdent, and this is going to be for the dot button item. So I'm going to write dot button. And here I'll go ahead and add a couple of rules for padding, for border, for background color, and for the font color. All right, so my search field is coming together. I'm going to write a few more rules right here. The next rule that I'm going to write is going to be for my article and I'm going to use colon before. We're gonna go ahead and we're gonna add a clear here. This will allow the float to be cleared. Currently, my main headline is floating up here to the left, and I want that to be cleared. So I'm gonna add the clear both. I'll add a content of nothing and a tell it to display as block. If we save now and refresh, you'll see that the main headline now is underneath the search. What this selector is doing is it's going ahead and it's going into my article and before any of this other content has been generated, it's adding a pseudo class of before and that's where we're applying our clear. So this is clearing the floated items. So you can see how handy it is to nest the selectors. Your code is going to be really clean and it's very obvious that these elements are children of this parent element thanks to indenting. The results are simply going to be more specific selectors, which work great on our page.